How does a person who knows the Bible and who knows that the Bible is God's word and yet has chosen not to follow it, not much hope there, is there? We talk about the influence of the Bible. And why is that, why is that a topic that we would fit into that? Uh, again, our, our general topic is the foundations of our biblical foundations. And we're talking about being able to feel uh, comfortable that, that, that the Bible is God's word. Why does the impact of the Bible or how does the impact of, of the Bible uh, on the world and history play into that, into that topic, would you say? Ron, uh, let's uh, uh, let uh, Stacy get to you with the microphone if you have a comment. I think the Bible prevents chaos at all levels of society. It gives us a standard that we can live by and know that we are not causing the other guy uh, a lot of problems, so sure. to speak. Exactly. If, if, if not for the Bible, and I know there are other religious works that have been written, but if not for the Bible, why would murder be wrong? We would be nothing but we would be nothing but animals. We would be we would you know be basically just the same as an animal. An animal has no qualms about killing another animal if it needs to eat, or or killing another animal just if it makes it mad, or what have you. Uh, the Word of God influences us by giving us a moral standard by which we live, and it and it creates order in our society rather than rather than chaos as is as is in the animal kingdom now what about if you have your 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 questions that uh that that we have for today's lesson if you don't have them raise your hand and Stacey will bring them one but what what about the first question talks about about most popular books what is the the fate of most popular books that are written throughout of throughout history in other words, what uh, typically happens uh, in terms of how those books are looked at? Back in yeah, read once. The mo the most influential ones of them probably are still read today. But uh, what are some examples of maybe some some of the most influential books in history? Maybe some of you literature buffs or literature majors. I can't say that I've read a lot of the great classics, you know, but uh, I have read a few, but I know some of the titles. War and Peace is one that comes to mind, uh, which I've not read. I wish I had, and maybe one day I will, but uh, absolutely is a good example. Um, uh, I think I had a couple other ones written down. Uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin uh, is, is mentioned as one of the, one of the great works. And a great and a very influential work. How how did Uncle Tom's Cabin, if you're familiar with that, with that, how did that influence society? Not the world, because it was a it was an American book. But how did it influence our society? It was written prior to the Civil War, and uh, it it basically was one of the works that sort of pointed out the fact that slavery really is wrong. Abraham Lincoln made the statement that to some degree the, the, the existence of the book Uncle Tom's Cabin prompted the Civil War. That it brought the Civil it brought the argument to a head basically which had been which had been you know brewing literally for since the inception of our country. The argument over slavery had been going on since since George Washington was president. And, you know, gradually, over the, <clears throat> over the course of time, more and more people began to realize that this is a wrong thing that we're doing. And, uh, you know, according to Abraham Lincoln, that book had the influence that it actually brought about the Civil War and, and eventually brought about the end of slavery. So that's a tremendously influential book, obviously. That... that yeah, I, I understand that. That's that's really Take not. Take a look at Exodus, Exodus, and the slavery that was going on back then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's a that's a, a a very deep discussion. There are a lot of there are a lot of reasons there are a lot of reasons that the Civil War. Yeah, yeah. There's a there's a lot of reasons that the Civil War happened, but but obviously that was that was you know one of the one of the factors that that played into that. 
but the point that I was making is that that book had that kind of influence on it. What about books that have negative influence, but that are that have powerful in books? Can anybody influence? Can anybody think of one? What about uh, Hitler's uh, testimony called Mein Kampf? Has anybody ever heard of that? Basically, his declaration about how the world ought to be just a horrible book, and it and it basically influenced the minds of the German people to follow him in his, in his obvious lunacy that he was doing, which brought about, you know, the, the Holocaust and all of the horrible atrocities that happened, brought about what is probably one of the most horrible wars this world has ever seen. So, so that book obviously had very powerful impact, but it was a negative impact, obviously. Now, but the question is, what is the fate of even those books? Is Mein Kampf a book that people read today? Is War and Peace one that people read? Yeah. Uh, not to the extent of, of the Bible, obviously. But the answer, you know, to the question, as, as, as uh, Carrie pointed out, they, they might be read one time. Uh, <clears throat> how many people have read a, a favorite book more than one time? Most, a lot of people have. But how many have read a favorite book as often as you've read the Bible? Obviously not. The Bible obviously has far more impact, far more influence, and, it, and has much more far-reaching influence than any book that's ever been written. Uh, there's really no comparison. No comparison. <clears throat> so I want to read a couple of verses, and I don't know exactly the appropriate time, but I'm going to go ahead and put this in there. Just... just a couple of verses about what about what the Bible itself says about its own influence in our lives. Uh, Hebrews four and verse twelve says, "For for the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and inten- intentions of heart." So, very powerful self-statement about about the word. That it is more powerful than a sword and can cut and divide not physical things, but hearts and souls and, and people. Um, we know, of course, 2 Timothy 3.16, all, scripture, all scriptures is breathed out by God, inspired by God, as we, as we used that word a couple of weeks ago. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. The Word of God gives us everything we need, everything we need to know in terms of, of serving God. And of course, Paul said in Romans um, 1.16, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. If we believe that the Bible is truly God's Word, then that statement is one of the most powerful statements that, that there is, because all that matters... If, if we are indeed lost because of our sins, the only thing in this whole world that really matters is avoiding the consequences of that sin and gaining salvation. And that verse tells us that the Word of God is that which is powerful enough to provide us the means of salvation. So obviously, uh, the Bible is influ- influential to a great degree to the ultimate degree on those who believe the Bible, on those who follow the Bible. But the question is, to what degree is the Bible influential over people who don't follow it? Would you say that it does have influence over people who don't follow it? Yes. Yes. Obviously, and that's sort of what this lesson is is about. Um, Third verse, what book has influenced more than any other world obviously the answer to that is the bible but i think the point i'm trying to make is it's not just that the bible's number one but it's like you know it's like up here is is the influence of the bible and second place and everything else is about a thousand miles below that you know that's how the 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 level to which um the bible has the bible has had influence the fourth question is what is the general influence of the bible on the world toward hope or despair that's, don't be too obvious about your answer to that. Is, does the Bible give the world hope or despair? Hope, but it depends on how you look at the Bible, right? Depends on your perspective, yeah. How, how, does, 
How does a person who knows the Bible and who knows that the Bible is God's word and yet has chosen not to follow it, not much hope there, is there? In fact, I, I would say that that gives them despair because they know that they know that truth is out there. They know that it's there. And yet I'm not, uh, I'm not convicted in my heart enough to follow that word then I know what my inevitable fate is. I think the, the answer to the, 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 the question is really looking for is that it, it does give hope. Um, what kind of hope does an atheist have? Well, Ron, make your point, and if you want to answer that question, go ahead also. I'll answer the question, none. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I think people have a hard time uh, dealing with the fact that God is as... Uh, vengeful as he is loving he's vengeful in the fact that if you don't obey him John 14 15 15 14 all those type verses that say if you love me keep my commandments we forget about the commandments many do and have a hard time dealing with why he would uh, do a certain thing to us and not uh, be forgiving Paul said in uh, Romans 6, after he talked about all of our misgivings, he said, shall we continue in sin? God forbid. Yep. So, uh, yep. My answer was that we have a hard time separating or dealing with the vengeance of God as right. well as his love. That's right. And, and I think that's the reason that, that a lot of people reject the Bible or find an excuse not to follow the Bible is because they can't they can't grasp the concept that that's one of the reasons they can't grasp that concept that that God could be a vengeful God that God is a demanding God he's a fearful God uh, he is to be feared because his his righteousness demands that there be consequences for failing to follow, follow him but he is also a merciful God but the mercy is dependent on us having faith Exactly. So if somebody doesn't have a good full understanding of the Bible and they see this vengeful God and, they, and that's all they see, then they might reject it. But if they have, if you take an a, a, a f- overall approach and look at the whole, as, as Ron is pointing out, then, then you see the goodness of God and you see the justness of God. So back to that question of the atheist, what, what hope does an atheist have? Well, you said none, and in, in, in reality, that's right. But in his heart, he thinks, I, I don't have to worry about that. I, there is nothing after this life. There's no God. There is no uh, consequences. There's no afterlife. So when I die, I'm just like, you know, what was the expression we used to use? Like the little dog rover, I'm dead all over, you know? Uh, that's how some people, that's how an atheist thinks. But, and that's how some religious groups think. But realistically, I think that's how a lot of us, even if we say we believe the Bible, when I say we, I'm, I'm talking about our society as a whole. You know, we say we believe the Bible, but do we always live that way? You know, do we live under the impression that there really is a consequence for sin, an eternal consequence, or that there is an eternal reward for following God? Yes, sir. That, that we also live under grace. Mm-hmm. That's correct. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Yep. Uh, see if we can get see if we can get the mic here real quick. Well, I mean, and that's what the scripture says: for we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So no one has lived, even knowing rightfully what we should do we've all still sinned yeah. so obviously we don't all even though we know what the answer is and what we should be doing we don't right i mean that's just yep point out. To, you're absolutely correct to 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 a very large degree we all know what's right even those of us who are you know quote faithful christians we know what's right and then we walk out this building and and so often do what we know is not right and to Daryl's point, that's where grace comes in. Because of God's grace, that, that unmerited favor, that, that gift that we don't deserve, 
we still get we still get to have a hope of salvation but not if we just you know completely dismiss God's word another point here warns us about abusing grace shall we continue in sin that grace may abound God forbid right yep exactly exactly we can't say God and we all sin every day of our lives and through the grace of God he may sa- he will save us and that if we try with the best to our ability to live a Christ-like life and that and he realizes that we all fall short we all slip and we we don't control our tongue sometimes and that and I'm one of them and so so grace we say we are saved by grace not by grace only, but by grace. Absolutely. And, and Ron's point is, is absolutely true. That, Romans points out that doesn't mean I can just say I'll just sin all I want to because that way grace has that much more impact. You know, that's sort of the fallacy of, of the thinking there. But um, kind of pulling us back to our, to, our, to our topic, question number five talks about this, this person named Voltaire who probably most of us have heard of or read of he, some famous French author you know from many years ago but he was an atheist and we asked the question what hope does an atheist have he he expressed a great deal of of um, despair I guess you would say when he said the box of Pandora is the most beautiful fable of antiquity hope is at the bottom you can never reach it I'm not sure exactly <laughs> how to interpret that, but basically he's saying no matter how hard you look in this life to find deep joy, hope of, of something better than what we have, there's nothing there. And for an atheist, that's true. You know? Yes, Stacy. One, one of the things that, that um, when I read that, it's been a long time since I've read about the box of Pandora, so I looked it up. <laughs> <laughs> so... Uh, but it talked about in that box when you start losing things and you lose trust and you lose grace and you lose all those positive attributes um, and, and his point and maybe there's some truth to that that then in society we've lost a lot of that stuff mm-hmm. you know we don't behave the way we should we don't uh, uh, respect God we don't respect the Bible we don't have grace we don't have with each other uh, we don't have trust with each other and, and when you lose those things, the only thing left is the hope that it might come back. Right. And um, I, think, I, I think the Bible gives us that hope. Right. Right. Nothing else really does give that kind of hope. Maybe, maybe some aspects of this life gives us hope that there can be something better in this life. You know, uh, people could point to the United States of America and the and the the way that we were founded based on individual freedoms and all that, that gives the world a lot of hope that there can be better things in the world. But, you know, I think for the atheist, you know, as, as Voltaire's pointing out, I can look in that box and I can see, you know, something better, but what's the real hope? Where's the real deep hope of something beyond this life? The, 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 the only thing that the, that the atheist has that comforts him is, again, that there is nothing after this life. I can live any way I want to, and then when I'm dead, you know, I'm just gone. But there's so much emptiness in, in the life of a person that doesn't have God in their life, that doesn't have faith. You know, you can, and probably most of us that have experienced, you know, you see... You see, you hear so many stories about, about people that their entire life's pursuit was getting more, more and more and more, whether it be more money or more possessions or more power. Look at the, look at the book of Ecclesiastes, and we could probably spend some time studying that uh, if we really wanted to. But look at, look at Solomon. All of the people today, you know, uh, Jeff Bezos and all these guys are not anything compared to Solomon. He was just wealthy beyond imagination and then read the book of Ecclesiastes and how he recognized that he had spent his entire life pursuing all these things pursuing more 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 
And when he got to the end of his life, he said, it's just all vanity and vexation of spirit, as the, as the King James says it. Striving for the wind is what, what the, the, the literal translation of that. It's just trying to grab something. The, the, the illustration that I've used with people is that we all have this giant hole inside of us, this emptiness, for some reason, for whatever reason. Generally, it's because of our sin, obviously. But people are trying to fill that hole up with something. And some people do it with the pursuit of money. Some people do it with pursuit of, of fun things. You know, getting really involved in uh, their favorite football team. Or, you know, maybe you love deer hunting. Or maybe you really enjoy reading or Maybe you're a businessman who just wants to make as much money as you can or whatever it is. Some people try to fill that hole up with drugs and with illicit sexual activities and just all kinds of things to try to get that satisfaction that they're looking for. And the influence of the Bible is that it tells us how to fill that hole up. You know, it tells us how we can find that true, lasting, deep satisfaction that if we just follow it, if we just uh, put our faith in God and dismiss our life from all those other things, then that hole's going to be filled up. You know, we spend our life finding more and more satisfaction. And those of us that are older, which, you know, to a large degree, several of us are in here, we, f we find that that's true more and more and more as we get older. Instead of, the, instead of the rich guy who gets to the end of his life and says, you know, what have I done? It, it, it's all gone. It's all worth nothing. Those of us who are Christians, hopefully we, we as we get older, we just see that, that joy and, that, and that, uh, that fulfillment more and more and more. You know, a lot of the, lot of the rich people, to their credit, uh, spend the latter years of their life just giving their, their riches away. Uh, Rockefeller. Uh, not Rockefeller, uh, yeah, Standard Oil. The, uh, uh, John D. Rockefeller founded Standard Oil and was the richest man that America has ever seen. I think I think some of the ones today are finally getting close to approaching, but I don't I don't think they're really even close to as rich as he was, comparatively speaking. Uh, we we went and visited some of the Rockefeller homes last summer with my son. I told Harrison, I said. There was a small group of people, you know, that they didn't just have a lot of money. They had most of it. And that's literally true. They literally owned most of the wealth of this country. And, of course, a lot of that changed in the, in the late 1800s and, and early 1900s. But they, a lot of those guys spent their latter years just giving their money away because they realized how useless it really, really was in finding true happiness. And they found some measure of, of satisfaction and happiness by doing some good with their money in their, in their latter years. And so that, you know, like I said, to their credit. Any comments or, or uh, this, this, this topic really kind of lends itself just to some, some kind of wide open discussion. I want to be careful about our next question here because I don't want to get, as I mentioned earlier, I don't want to get deep into a discussion of slavery or anything like that. But the question, the next question is, what influence did the Bible have on slavery? Or has the Bible had? I guess slavery definitely still exists in the world. What influence has it had on it? What was commanded of the Jews and how they were to treat their their slaves, the slaves' wives and their children. Right. They had it pretty down, pretty fast. How to treat treat right. their, their 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 slaves. Yes. They also did. It also handled it in the New Testament that the, a slave was a, just as in Christ's eyes was just as equal to his master. So there are good things if followed yes. correctly relative to our, our uh, in this society. Yes, exactly. And, and, and here's one of the interesting things that if you read the Bible, did God come into the world and say, slavery is wrong, you've got to get rid of it? Do you find that in the Bible? Uh, no, <laughs> we don't. And unfortunately, some people during the, the slavery debates of the, of the 1800s and, and sadly probably still even today, some people will take that thought and say, well, the Bible doesn't condemn slavery, therefore it's okay. Is that, is that a correct statement? 
Stacy. You know, if, if you go back and look at the concept of slavery uh, during this time, um, when the Romans captured uh, Greece, you know, they didn't bring back, they, they brought back Greek citizens as slaves, but they brought them back as slaves because they wanted to make them the, uh, run their households, teach their children, because the Greeks had a uh, greater knowledge level in, in terms of art and history and music and philosophy and those types of things. So it wasn't just as, as laborers like we commonly think of slaves today. I think that the, the place in the Bible that where it talks about slavery pretty specifically is in the book of Philemon. Um, and there's only 25 verses in that entire book. Mm -hmm. But if you look at the, the middle part of that, it says there, uh, um, Paul is talking, uh, pleading for Onesimus to be forgiven because Onesimus has left, his, has left Philemon, has run away as a slave. Uh, so he says, uh, Paul says, Therefore, although in Christ I could be bold and order you to do what you ought to do, yet I appeal to you on the basis of love, I then as Paul, an old man and now also a prisoner of Christ Jesus, appeal to you for my son Onesimus who became my son while I was in chains. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he's become both useful, useful to you and to me. I am sending him, who is my very heart, back to you. I would have liked to keep him with me so that he could take your place in helping me while I am in chains for the gospel, but I did not want to do anything without your consent so that any favor you do will be spontaneous and not forced. Perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a little while was that you might have him back for good, no longer as a slave, but better than a slave, as a dear brother. He is very dear to me, but even dearer to you, both as a man and as a brother in the Lord. Um, you know, while, while he sent Onesimus back, he sent him back in a very different role uh, than, than he had, right. he had when he left. But he was still a slave. Yeah. He still sent him back as a slave. So that, that, you know, that brings to mind the question, why didn't the Bible condemn slavery? Is slavery wrong? Hopefully we don't have to answer that question. Hopefully you recognize that's a, a rhetorical question. Obviously slavery is wrong. Carrie, back here. No matter whether slavery is wrong or right, it, we, we know that it's not necessarily a fair practice. It has continued from the beginning of time. It still goes on in other countries. Even, you know, my boys and I talk about this often in the Sudan because what happens is a lot of countries, when they're overthrown, their strongest and their most threatening are sold into slavery to get them away from, from overtaking them again. And so, I mean, it just, it's a, a continual thing that happens. And so I think that what the Bible tries to do is to take things where history does tend to repeat itself and give it a practical application. Right. So as far as as Daryl was saying earlier, that's why it you know I believe that's why it talks about slavery and how the Jews were to treat their slaves and and that they still had value in God's eyes even mm -hmm. whether you're a Jew or a Greek, a slave or a free man, doesn't matter. You still have value to the Lord right. and should be treated as people. Exactly. And ultimately that's that's where I my, in my belief. Yeah, and, and the that. fact that the Bible doesn't come out and, and tell, you know, the world to do away with slavery is basically just part of the, the fact that God allows us to be agents of free moral choice. He, he doesn't force us to obey Him. He gives us what's right and what's wrong, and He gives us the, ch he gives us the choice. Now, the fact that, that, that Paul, you know, talked about the proper way to treat slaves or the fact that the Bible in more than one place talks about the proper way to treat slaves. That's not condoning slavery. It's just acknowledging the fact that slavery does exist in the world. As Kerry pointed out, slavery, you know, didn't just come up as a new concept in, when this country was started. And, and you know, that, I, I think some of us have a tendency to think uh, only in the United States was there a slavery problem. Slavery has existed all over the world. And in fact, if you're, if you're in business, you recognize that there are all kinds of anti-slavery requirements for doing business. We're not allowed to do business with certain countries because of their, because of their slavery practices. And the fact uh, that the big thing that's, that's that's a, a, a major factor right now is sex slaves. P women in particular are being captured 
in mostly foreign countries, but I think it's happening even here, and forced into sexual work. Uh, you know, just hard to even imagine that, that this is going on in this day and time, but that's just the nature of the evil that's in the world. The infants at the present time in our society is women sex slaves, but also the fact being is that if you go deeper and study it a little bit more, you find also um, boys and men also uh, having the same problems relative to, to being sex slaves. So it's just not only women. Yeah, that's, that's absolutely true. I think, it's, I think obviously women, it's just the more common, but definitely there's all kinds of, of sex slaves as well. And, you know, forced labor type slavery, as Carrie was pointing out as well. Now, how, does the, how did the Bible influence the, the fact that we've made progress in that? How did the Bible influence the slavery question in, in this country? And I think the point of the question is, how, does, how do we know that, that slavery really is wrong? Not because the Bible comes out and says slavery is wrong, you've got to get rid of it, but because we're told how to treat our fellow man, because we're told how to, to be uh, uh, kind and loving toward fellow, fellow kind. So slavery obviously violates that, that concept. So uh, it's a, it's a real deep political discussion that I don't want to get into, but the way that our founding fathers looked at slavery, there, there weren't that many people that thought of it as being anything wrong back then. And we think about how racist that was. In a sense, it was, it was not racist. It was worse than racism because the slaves were not looked at as a race. They were looked at as, a, as property. They were looked at, in some cases, as not even being human beings, probably in a lot of cases. A lot of people didn't even think of their slaves as being human, human people. So it was worse than racism. And it doesn't justify. The majority of people did think people, slaves, were people. Yeah. Country and, at all. On and, the basis of that, the, you take a look at the opportunities that has been provided since I have been born relative to the, the things that have that were wrong that went on and that we are trying to remedy at the present time. And at the present time, we are immensely being taken advantage of by a group that and, that. that I want to say it. Yep. Well, and and here's here's the point I was going to make is that is that the way that people thought of slavery back then and and how they how they reacted to it was based on their knowledge at the time. Even our founding fathers, most of our founding fathers uh, owned slaves. John Adams was the first of the of the first several presidents that did not own slavery, own slaves. Did they think of it as wrong? I know if you read some of the writings, some of the writings, there were there were thoughts about it. There were starting to be thoughts about is this something we really should be doing, you know? But you can't really uh, look at the way that they thought about it based on how we on the knowledge that we have today. You know, we have the knowledge of how wrong it is today. They didn't really have that knowledge. They hadn't come to that full knowledge at that time. And the point is, where did they get that knowledge? Where did that come into play? Most of those men had a deep knowledge of the Bible. Yes. And if, like Stacy read a while ago, they read Paul's address to Philemon about Onesimus, however you say that, uh, that would give them some guidance on how to treat anybody, yes, no matter what his status. Exactly. And so over the course of time, because of their under, understanding largely of the, of the Bible and the morality that comes from the Bible, they came to an understanding that this is not, not the right thing. Obviously, it took a horrible war to bring us to that point, but eventually we came to that understanding that this is, this is wrong. 
you know, whether you're talking about slavery or whether you're talking about the, the perception we have of women in our society today, whatever it is that we're talking about, I think the purpose of the lesson that we're talking about here is that the Bible is an influence for good. Um, do we all do what the Bible says? Um, even though we try, no. There are some people who ignore the Bible, some people who don't think it's anything worth looking at, but it is an influence for good. And unless we had that in our lives, unless we had the Bible in our world, uh, I think we'd be a lot worse off than, than we are today. Um, it's not to say that we're great today, but, but um, uh, I think we'd be a lot worse than we are. Yeah. I mean, if you look at the, at, the, at the Romans, which is probably the next question or so you're gonna to get to, yes. um, I mean, women were treated as property. Uh, if you killed your wife, there's any punishment for that. I mean, you prob she probably deserved it. Um, but uh, <clears throat> it's not that way today. Why is it not that way? You know, we don't just make this stuff up. Um, right. There has to be an influence for good somewhere that says, hey, here's the way you treat people with respect. Here's the way you treat people with dignity. And I think the in that, that influence is the biblical influence that, that, that has uh, been in our society for hundreds of years and hopefully will continue to be for years more. Um, that's where that comes from. That's the right. source of it. And I, I appreciate those comments, the very concise comments very, very much because, you know, it's, it's a difficult discussion to lead because we're not here to discuss the merits of slavery or what brought about slavery or why it took so long to get rid of it. We're not here to discuss the Equal Rights Amendment and how women should be treated. We're just we're here to you know the the point of our lesson is as Stacy pointed out is the fact that we've made progress the fact that things are better in most of these situations now is largely if not mostly due to the influence of the Bible to the influence of of moral standards in the world and where do those moral standards come from they come from the Bible would would we have any concept of back to how we started from the beginning would we have any concept of how to treat each other if it were not some, some kind of influence in the world that says it's wrong to do this, it's right to do this, love one another, treat each other right, treat each other, what did, what's the Jesus golden rule? Do unto others as you would do, un, as you, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. I get that mixed up sometimes in the joke version of that as do unto others before they do unto you, so I have to be careful how I quote that. Um, uh, there, there, there's no there's no beginning point for any of that without without some sort of spiritual religious documentation that exists now as I said there are other are other documents but none are as old as the Bible and none and a lot of them are basically just copies of, of thoughts that the Bible that the Bible has stated so the very foundation of morality does not come from the fact that man exists it comes from the fact that there is a God who gave us a guide in our life to have that kind of morality as you said with 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 how women are treated and a lot of the a lot of the the bad treatment of women unfortunately is based on misunderstanding what the Bible says about women in the attempt to, to separate I think church and state we've gone way beyond what what we should have done but I know up until just the last few years, almost every courthouse in the country had the Ten Commandments posted somewhere in the courthouse, because that was the foundation of civil law. I mean, that's, that's the origin, if you will, right. of where our legal system, the framework under which our legal system w was created. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, that, and uh, you know, that's, that's fine. So wh whether you put it on the wall or whether you don't, doesn't take away from the, the fact that, that uh, like you said earlier, um, if we don't murder people, don't steal from people, right. we're no more than animals. Right. Right. Um, animals do that all the time. They murder each other. They, they, they steal food. They, uh, you know, it's the survival exactly. of the fittest. That's not the way it is with human beings because we live under God's rule. Exactly. It's it's why you know why do we have civil laws that say you can't steal from each other? Not just because we came to that of our own accord, but because we were given a set of guidelines in the Bible. And whether we, whether we believe those all the same way or whether we believe them all, all, at, at all or not, the, the, the concept of morality comes from God's Word. I don't think anybody could deny that. 
I really don't. I'm sure there are probably some psychologists or psychiatrists that, that will say there's this in, in, innate sense of good in man. I don't think that's true. <laughs> I think there's plenty of, of evil in the world that points out that it's not necessarily there. The goodness that we have comes from, from the influence of the Bible. Okay, a few more of these questions, and some of them get a little bit uh, <clears throat> into a little bit more detail type things than what we're looking at. But it talk, it, uh, our lesson talked about the divorce rate. How has divorce changed over the over the history of the last several years. Unfortunately, that's, a, that's an area where the Bible has had influence among the people who follow it to a large degree, but, but uh, the divorce rate obviously has increased dramatically in the last, you know, what, 50 or 100 years. Why do you suppose that, that's, that, that, is, that that is true? Why was the divorce rate lower than it was for so many years? Where do we get the concept that divorce is wrong, or right or wrong? Obviously from the Bible, right? So we lived at a time up until the, I don't know when the, I don't know when the trend started really trending upward, but we lived at a time where, where for the most part, our society, and I guess I'm thinking specifically about the United States, we, we won't talk about Europe or the other countries because the, the numbers would probably be different there, but for the most part, up until probably the 60s or so, people generally in this country accepted that the Bible was the Word of God. Now, they may not have followed it. They, they may not have uh, lived a moral life, but they would acknowledge, well, I know I'm not doing what the Bible tells me to do. You know, you hear people saying things like that. Or they would say things like, I know I'm going to go to hell if I don't change my ways. You know, I remember, I remember hearing a guy, you know, say that. So as a general rule, they accepted that the Bible was the influence. And then with whatever happened in the craziness of the 60s and then the free love of the 70s and all that and more and more people became accepting of atheism and agnosticism and people began rejecting the Bible more and more then all of a sudden the divorce rate increased and so many other of the of the moral issues that we have in our society today began increasing more and more and more breakdown of the family breakdown of the foundation of our society and um all of that's based on the fact that our society stepped away from the influence of the Bible. They're no, not allowing the, the influence of the Bible, the, they're not allowing the Bible to have the influence that it had at one point. Yes? Our society has developed the attitude is what's mine is mine, is <clears throat> not yours. And, and they do not follow the First, Corinth, first Corinthians that, that when you are married, a man is supposed to supposed to treat his wife as Christ treated us on the basis of the fact. Absolutely. And that yep. and it's supposed to be a joint. Yep. A and here's here's something else that happened in the '70s is we started having people writing books like uh, what's the title of the one I'm thinking of? Um, Pulling your own strings, and I'm okay, you're okay. And there was a lot of emphasis on our society that said, you take care of yourself. You're the most important person in your world. You make sure you're happy and then worry about everybody else. Is that what the Bible teaches? Obviously not. I mean, we could look at a thousand verses that says, think not for your own good, but for the good of others. And when we started getting to that point where people started focusing on themselves, we moved more and more away from allowing the Bible to have the influence on us that it, that it has. Uh, we're just about out of time. In fact, I think we are. Is there any other comments? Okay. We also, when you get married, or even when you're thinking about getting married, you have to commit to that person that you're going to marry. Absolutely. That's there's correct. No, there's no firm commitment today. I believe that's exactly correct. Thank you for your comments on that. Yes. Okay, so thanks, thank you for all of your comments.